and now we can move to the uh, to the physics program. If Frank has uh, his talk somewhere, or, uh... Uh, while Frank is uh, installing his laptop, let me say that uh, Frank is one of the. Uh, uh, he actually got the first. Uh, ideas of this uh, circular machine and the first one to calculate its performance in a serious way and so it's been a you know since three years now we've been pushing and we've been making a little bit of a revolution in the, in the field not a revolution because it's circular but a little revolution because it turns things upside down and uh, it's been really uh, great because he's a completely enthusiastic guy, always looking at the positive things and at the, uh, the way things are going. Now there's a number, there's two talks of Frank. The first one is about the FCC organization as a whole, the organization of the study. Uh, and then we'll have a talk by Ricardo who will explain to us what is the situation of particle physics after the discovery of the Higgs boson. Uh, and then we have a coffee break, I think. And then Frank will talk again. He will present the accelerator, um, the two accelerators, the EE, the electron-positron machine, and the Hadron Collider. Uh, here we go. So Frank, you're set. You need your um, microphone. Okay. okay. Okay, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. <coughs> I thank the organizers for inviting me. It's been has been quite a busy last week and I still recovering from a cold, but I hope I can hmm? This one? Ah, probably not. Oh, yeah, okay. <clears throat> okay, anyway, this first talk should give an overview of the FCC study, the scope, and the collaboration status. Okay, there's the outline, so some motivation, then the key parameters of the various machines, a few, perhaps very few of the challenges, and then the study organization and the summary. Okay. This official study started after the European Strategy Update for Particle Physics in 2013, uh, where the second highest priority after the full exploitation of the LAC was at the uh, request to CERN <coughs> to propose an, uh, to prepare an ambitious post-LAC accelerator project by the time of the next uh, strategy update. So uh, in order, uh, at, sorry, this accelerator project should be at CERN. And in order to do so, CERN should undertake design studies for accelerator projects in a global context with emphasis on proton-proton and electron-positron high-energy frontier machines. And this should be coupled to a vigorous R&D program including high-field magnets and high-gradient exciting structures in collaboration with national institutes, laboratories, and universities worldwide. So the, the full text of the strategy update can be found at that address on the web. And the strategy, the strategy was adopted by the CERN Council in a special meeting at Brussels in May 2013 in presence of the European Commission. So, so following this, an official study was launched at CERN, which is the FCC study. And the goal is to have a conceptual design report and a cost review by the time of the next European strategy update in 2008, around 2018, at a time when the new results from the LHC at higher energy uh, should become available, should be available. So in the, in the study, we are forming international collaboration. So study <coughs> with the main focus on a proton-proton collider, which is called the FCCHH, which will define the overall infrastructure and size of the machine. <coughs> And the target is to have a 100 TeV center of mass 
proton proton collision. This can be achieved in a 100 kilometer ring if we use a 16 Tesla uh, dipole magnets. The LHG has 8.3 Tesla, so 16 Tesla is about twice the strength of an LHG magnet. Could be somewhat smaller if instead of 16 Tesla we could use 20 Tesla magnets. This is an option that is also studied. So if we, if we build such a new big tunnel infrastructure, then this tunnel could also accommodate an E plus E minus collider, which is called FCCE, and this could be a nice uh, potential intermediate step because uh, we are far from, from building these magnets needed for the proton collider, so there could be well, an intermediate period where we, where we could exploit the tunnel for, for very beautiful E plus E minus physics. The study also includes a hadron electron collider option. So here on this plot on the right side, you can see the geography that the LHG looks quite small on this scale, and then the new machine FCC, it's kind of tangential to the LHC. At one point, it passes under the lake of Geneva and it goes around the Salaf. So, and for the first time, there's a large part of the machine on the other side of the Geneva in the, in the Haute Savoie region. Not as far as Pisa. We are close to Annecy, so there is a thinking that there could be, in addition to the CERN campus here, there could be a second campus down here, maybe relatively close to Annecy. Um, okay, there were many similar studies in the past. There's a, actually an ongoing INFN project in Italy, the Eloisatron project, since 40 or 50 years, which is an even bigger machine, three, I think 300 kilometers which fits fitting into Sicily. And there were many studies. There was a big SSC project in Texas, which was unfortunately abandoned in 93. But we have the design report and many books from that study. There was another study, very large Hadron Collider at Fermilab for a 240 kilometer collider, which was finished around 2002, 2003. And there were even some old studies in Japan of a 94 kilometer ring, one near in Tsukuba and the other in Fukushima at the time. This, this was abandoned when the SSC project in Texas uh, uh, started. Okay, meanwhile, on the other side of the globe, we have, there's a serious competition. There is a study initiated by the Chinese Academy of Science, which is called the CEPC-SPPC study, a Chinese electron-positron collider and a super-proton-proton collider. They have a very ambitious time schedule. It's a similar machine, first E plus E minus collider, followed by a proton collider in the same tunnel. They have finished more or less a preliminary CDR already now, which they will submit to their government during this month. And then they hope to have uh, five years of R&D and would then start construction. They aim for first E plus E minus collisions in 2028 and first proton collision 2042. And the, one of the preferred sites is shown here. It's called the Qinghuang Dao. This is, <coughs> this is relatively close to Beijing, 300 kilometers east of Beijing, and can be reached in one hour with the TGV. And uh, also it's called the Chinese Toscana because there are some, some hills and uh, some vineyards, and also the best beach of China. So normally the, the party leaders, they spend their summer vacation in that region. So here's a picture of the table of contents of the preliminary CDR of the Chinese machine. And at the moment, they have about 250 authors. But everybody in the world can register and, and become an author of this design. <laughs> OK, then I remind you, USP5 recommendations came one year after the European strategy update. And uh, US scientists, they pointed out the importance of the proton collider. So, the motivation for future generations actually must be the science drivers and a very high energy proton-proton collider is the most powerful future tool for direct discovery of new particles and interactions under any scenario of physics results that can be acquired in the P5 time window. The P5 time window, I think, is the next 20 years or so. So also in the US, uh, the proton-proton collider is, a, is supportive, is a very high priority. This allows for collaboration. So now I turn a little bit more into detail here. So this Hadron Collider is, I think, for the presently and for the coming de de decades, it's the only option we have for exploring energy scale at tens of TeV directly. 
in the energy reach of a hadron collider is given by a very simple formula. It's just uh, given by, basically by the product of the dipole magnetic field and the size of the machine. So for the FCC, we increase the size by uh, radius by factor three and a half or four with respect to the LHC. And we increase the field by factor two, that gives us a factor seven to eight in energy. So roughly almost the order of magnitude, uh, which, is a, which was a target, the goal was to go in order of magnitude up in energy. These are the baseline parameters in the center column compared to the present LHC. So machine. I think this works. This works? No? Okay, the first parameters I mentioned already, energy is 100 TV center of mass, magnetic field is 16 Tesla. A number of IPs is the same as in the LHC, two main IPs and two special purpose uh, collision points. Normalized emittance is 2.2 micron. Uh, it looks uh, smaller than the LHC uh, design emittance, but it's similar to what the LHC is operating uh, with at the moment. And uh, luminosity per IP is uh, 5 to the 34, which is equal to the luminosity of the high luminosity LHC, which should come as an upgrade of the LHC around 2024 or so. Okay, what is important, the energy is stored in each beam is much higher than in the LHC. So in the LHC it's 400 megajoule and in the FCC it's uh, almost 10 gigajoule. So this is cause of some concern. And another, another important change is the synchrotron radiation. In the LHC already the protons emit synchrotron radiation, but at the level of 0.2 watt per meter per aperture, which can be cooled with the present cryo system. For the FCCHH, this increases by a factor 100, so more than 100. In total, we have 5 megawatt synchrotron radiation power from the protons inside, and this comes inside the cold superconducting magnets. And we need to find a clever way to extract this energy from the, from the cold environment. Bunch spacing can be the same as for the LHC, and we're also looking at a shorter spacing, which would make a pileup easier and would allow it to reach higher luminosity. Um, okay, here a slide on the magnet R&D. 16 Tesla was chosen as a limit of what we hope to achieve with Niobium 3 tin technology. <coughs> and uh, Niobium 3 tin magnets in principle might, might could be operated at 4.2 Kelvin instead of 1.9 Kelvin as, a, for the, as for the present Niobium titanium dipoles of the LHC. Uh, 4.2 Kelvin would make the cryogenic, uh, <coughs> this Kano efficiency easier for, uh, for, uh, with regard to synchronization. radiation. Um, what else? So the goal of the FCCHH is to, to push the conductor development of the Nobium 3 tin superconductor for accelerator magnet applications. And uh, we want to build some short models with sufficient aperture for a beam. Uh, so and ideally, we would like to have these models in at least two out of three continents and by 2018-19, so America, Asia, or Europe. In, par in parallel, there's some HTS development, which aims at 20 Tesla. So there could be an HTS insert inside the uh, Nairum 3 tin dipole, for example, to boost the field from the 16 Tesla to 20 Tesla. And goal is listed. So this is also part of another European program. The UK2 has a goal to develop this five Tesla HTS insert. And uh, it should be put into another magnet, Fresca 2, which is an album 3 tin magnet and built at CERN. So this is ongoing in parallel. And uh, if, if that turned out to be very successful and cost efficient, then maybe later this 20 Tesla could become the baseline. Okay, US also works in parallel. US actually has done much more on the magnet R&D in the last 20 years. Um, and they submitted to their panel, to the HEPAP panel, they submitted a proposal which is summarized on this slide. So they also want to develop exciter magnet as a limit of Nairum 3 tin, study HTS inserts and drive the high field conductor development. And they aim for substantial reduction of magnet costs, etc. So this is very much aligned to what we want to do in Europe. And we think it's important to link a large-scale science project like FCC 
to ambitious technological developments. Because, <coughs> because if you, some people in the US, they made a cost estimate. If you use the present costs, then it turns out that the LHG magnets are the cheapest. So you build a, mag a, a much larger ring and put the present magnets there. But uh, in this way, you never get a new technology. So uh, one purpose of a new project is to, to push technologies which can be beneficial to other, other fields of science, like medical science, etc. Okay, well, also interesting is what was reported from China, superconductor price comparison. Uh, on the top there are the US prices, Nairum titanium, which is a material from which the LHG magnets are built, costs $300 per kilogram. Nairum C tin, which we want to use, at the moment is 10 times, almost 10 times as expensive in the US. And the HTS superconductor bismuth 2212 is another factor 10 more expensive. So that's why these high field magnets at the moment have a very high price. Now what's interesting is that the prices in China for HTS are, uh, seem to be a factor 10 lower. These are not exactly the same material, but very close. They can also maybe produce this one about a factor 10 lower than the prices in the US. And the Chinese companies, they promise another factor 10 cost reduction within the next 10 years. So, so that's why with this additional factor 10, the high temperature superconductor becomes as cheap as an iron titanium and magnets with 20 Tesla could be at the same price as the present LHC magnets. So this is quite interesting and it seems that there's a lot of optimism in our, with our Asian colleagues. Yeah? I think it's our goal to reduce that price by factor two or three at least. Also, our goal and the U.S. goal is to reduce this price. I, <clears throat> I'm not sure. I think both to reduce the price and to improve the performance. I think my room suite has already been pushed by the ETA program. I don't know, when you look at this, the performance has improved quite a bit thanks to ITER and thanks to the US core development program. Now, the price. Yeah. LHC is known titanium. The, the high luminosity the LHC will use about 40 magnets based on aluminum 3 tin. So it's, uh, this will, these will come within the next 10 years, so this is a very important step because the FCC will need 5,000 magnets written, but the high luminosity LHC will already use almost 50 such magnets. So that's, a, that's an important enemy step. But I cannot, I, I think it's a material, which is the dominant cost here is, is a material. For the HTS, it's a procedure. For the HTS, it's not the material, it's a manufacturing procedure. But I think that, Hmm? Which one? This IPCO is material. This IPCO, this IPCO is a process. The other one is material. Maybe this statement comes as mainly for IPCO, and they want to build magnets from IPCO, I believe. No, I believe that the niobium cavities for the ILC also, they used to be very expensive. And the price for that niobium has been brought down as part of this ILC R&D. So maybe the same, the hope is, I think, that the niobium 3 tin cost will also go down. But uh, I don't know, I don't. I think it also de depends on the, on the type of niobium 3 tin and the quality of the, of the scheme. Anyway, I think the goal is to factor two, three, four maximum, not a factor 10 for no room three ten. Nobody, nobody talks about a factor of 10. <coughs> okay, the supercon magnets are also needed for the detectors at the much higher energy to have the same resolution, a much higher field and a much bigger detector is needed. So, so BL square should be 10 times the Atlas or CMS, etc. So there's some, some scaling and some ideas. So the stored energy in this future detector magnet is also 50 gigajoules, for example. And uh, there's work ongoing. There are different options for, for detectors for such a 100 TeV proton. Typically, 
they have central solenoid or double solenoid and toroids, and then they have dipoles at the outer out, incoming and outgoing size. Okay, this is a plot we like to show the eight gigajoule in the or sixteen gigajoule in the beam corresponds to the kinetic energy of an Airbus A380 at full speed. And this has implication for collimation, beam loss control, radiation effects, uh, etc. And also injection will become very critical because injection is a when we inject from um, uh, from I don't know for example from the LHC into this FCC, then uh, there's always a danger something is wrong in the injection line and that all the bunches in one in one injection pulse hit some obstacle. So uh, as a result of this, probably we, we need to reduce the number of bunches that can be injected simultaneously uh, into, into the FCC. Maybe the number of bunches is much less than in the present LAC. Uh, okay, so anyway, this has been identified as a problem. And also the beam dump is a big issue. Uh, at the moment, there is no solution for if the, if the entire beam is ab aborted. Uh, at the moment, there is, no, there is no clear solution how to avoid the destruction of the beam dump. Okay, I turn to the lepton collider. I think here the main motivation is pushing the precision and the luminosity frontier. <clears throat> so the lepton collider is probably the best option to search for extremely rare decays of the Higgs, the Z, etc., and for precision coupling measurements. Luminosity energy reach roughly scale like this. Luminosity proportional to the radius, proportional to the synchronization radiation power, proportional to the beam beam tune shift and uh, goes with 1 over energy to the 1.8 and 1 over the vertical beta star. So if you compare to lab 2, we have a factor uh, roughly 4 in radius, a factor more than 4 in synchrotron radiation power, factor 50, as you will see, a factor 50 in the beta, 1 over beta y star. And, and uh, lab 2 at highest energy was not at the beam beam limit, so there's another factor more than 2 in the beam beam parameter. Okay. This shows you... Uh, <coughs> This lab E plus E minus collider runs at many different energies, so it's difficult to put in a single column the parameters, but the central column shows you the range. So we want to operate between the Z pole at 45 GB per beam up to the top quark threshold at 175 GB. Uh, and then <coughs> the synchrotron radiation power is kept constant at 100 megawatt for all energies, which is uh, slightly more than four times the maximum synchrotron radiation power in lab. Uh, <clears throat> this then translates into a beam current, which is a few milliamp at the top, and it's a one and a half ampere at the Z. So there's a huge range of, of beam currents to be accumulated. Horizontal emittance, is, thanks to the optics, is about a factor 10 lower than at lab 2, despite the higher energy. And also we aim for a much smaller vertical to horizontal emittance ratio. And then another gain is made by squeezing the vertical uh, beta function much more. Then the luminosity per IP, is a lot higher than in lab. Lab was uh, 1.2, 10 to the 30, what is this correct? 10 to the 31. And then this one, it starts at 1.8, 10 to the, around few, one or so, 10 to the 34 at the top and goes to at least 3, 10 to the 35 at the Z. Maybe even 10 times higher as I will show in the second talk. The energy loss per turn is of the order of a few GeV, similar to lab. And the maximum RF for addition is 11 gigavolt. And uh, since we have very many bunches, it's not listed here, but uh, yeah, it is. At the Z, we have around 20,000 bunches. If we have so many bunches, uh, it means we need to have two separate rings to accommodate the bunches. This also is better for optics control of the two rings and avoids issues with the sawtooth. So we want a double ring. And a beam lifetime is very short, which in order to support such a short beam lifetime of a few minutes, we need a continuous injection and a, a dedicated injector. And we inject into the collider, which runs at constant energy and constant beam current. Okay, here's some consideration on the RF parameters and R&D. So the key technology for the lepton collider is the radio frequency system. <coughs> and the lab 2 had a 352 megahertz RF. 3.5 gigawatt voltage and 22 megawatt radiation power for FCC EE. We, we choose at the moment a similar frequency, 400 megahertz voltage, is a, maximum voltage is about four times higher, 12 gigavolt, etc. So the key R&D issues are the supercavities, 
we, we want the maximum possible Q0 in order to minimize cryogenic losses in the cavities. We want a high gradient. And also, second point is we want RF power generation and distribution have to be a very high, have to be highly efficient in order to keep the wall plug power under control. And the system has to be very reliable in order that not to lose the beam too many times. Is a sketch of a collider ring with a dedicated booster ring, a fast cycling booster, which, which is used for the top-up injection. At the moment, we think a top-up frequency could be of the order of 0.1 hertz. Um, and the booster injection energy could be anywhere between 5 and 20 GeV. An unsolved issue is uh, bypasses. Since the booster has to be in the same tunnel as the collider, because at the, at the maximum energy, it has the same synchrotron radiation losses, it, the boostering must somehow bypass the experimental detectors. And, uh, we still have not agreed on a, on a clear solution. Uh, easiest would be to drill a hole in the detectors, but it's not much appreciated by the experimentalists. So if, we need, if we need a bypass, then we easily can add uh, uh, several kilometers of additional tunnel. Um, okay, so the good news is that as an example of an injector complex which meets our requirements, which is the injector for super AKKB, both in terms of, of rate and the number of positrons per second uh, and energy, it's more or less suitable, both for, both for electrons and positrons. Um, actually, it's shown here, actually, Super KKB Collider will start commissioning, should start commissioning this year if money is available. And this will not only test this injector complex and top up injection, but also uh, will test many other aspects. For example, the beta Y star in this machine is 300 micron, even more than three times smaller than what we want to do in FCCEE. The design lifetime is five minutes. It's also much shorter than what we expect for our high energy machine. And also in other aspects, uh, it's pushing. It's pushing all the, all the other um, features like off momentum acceptance and positron production rate. So, Basically, if the super KKB works as expected, that would be an absolute proof of the viability of all our design assumptions. So finally, the last collider in the FCC study is a lepton hadron collider. And here are some tentative parameters based on the idea that the electrons come from an energy recovery linear and collide at one point with a, with a hadron beam. Of course, we have another option is to collide in one of the electron beams of the FCCEE with a proton beam of the FCCHH, but at the moment it's under discussion if we can have all these machines at the same time in the same tunnel. If we cannot, we still have the option to build this dedicated energy recovery Linux for lepton hadron collisions. And if we do so, luminosity can also be of the order of 10 to the 34. And, um, <coughs> and the, I don't know, B, yeah? Mm -hmm. One is space in the domain, and the other one is simply the electricity. So in this case, you're not getting anything on the electricity because the, uh, the energy recovery net also consumes 50 megawatts of power. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, so, you know, this, this is really. No, 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 it's not a gigawatt. No, it's, it's 500 kilowatt, megawatt. Frank, can you repeat the question? Otherwise, people outside don't, don't uh, get it. The question? Uh, he has actually the microphone. My question the the uh, compatibility of this electron running together with the protons because of the power consumption at the same time as the uh, space in the in the ring. So I think it, having an energy recovery night does not solve anything with respect to having the uh, storage ring in the same tunnel. Yeah, but okay. <clears throat> I think that's true. Huh? So, but I think it, it still avoids having two machines in the same tunnel. It yeah. doesn't help for the electricity, but it helps for the 
quasi forgot some words. And we don't want it helps for the integration in the tunnel. You don't need you you can live with only the hadron machine in the tunnel. Okay, well I think we it's better to live with both machines in the tunnel because you don't have to ro to to build that uh, additional energy recovery now. Excuse me, I shouldn't take so much of your time. Anyway, we have two options, but at the moment it seems this one is the preferred option for the lepton hadron collider. Okay, then I turn to this to the study itself a little bit to the study structure. This is the top level of the work breakdown structure. Very early on, about 600 work units have been defined for this FCC study. And you can see that the study includes the physics and experiments, Hadron Collider, Lepton Collider, cannot even, <coughs> physics and experiments respectively, and also Lepton Hadron. And then on the exciter side, there's also Lepton Collider, Hadron Collider, the in injectors and the technology. And then you have infrastructure and other, other things. Okay. Yes. Okay, the study was launched officially at the FCC kickoff meeting in February 2014 at the University of Geneva, where Alain was the host. And uh, we are presently forming this global collaboration based on general memoranda of understanding between CERN and individual partners. This memorandum of understanding is very general, and then a specific addenda can be can be edited for each participant. Where, where, particular contributions and specific conditions are listed. So the, we also had the first International Collaboration Board meeting on 9th and 10th of September of 2014. And at that meeting, the Professor Lenny Rifkin from PSI and EPFL was endorsed as a preliminary or interim chair of this collaboration board. Then another thing. Another action we did was we submitted a design study proposal to the Horizon 2020 program of the European Commission. And we will have the first FCC week in end of March in Washington, D.C. So this is a general five-year work plan study. Uh, so we had the kick, this starts 2014, 2008, goes to 2018. We had the kickoff meeting somewhere here, somewhere here. And then this washing meeting will be the first big annual workshop uh, where we will identify a baseline and this ends, this terminates a phase, one year phase of weak interactions between the different parts of the study. And then the next phase is called the strong interaction phase and the next the following workshop should then somehow consolidate the results and perhaps in view of LHG, new LHG discoveries might need some rescoping and reorientation of the study, and then in 2017 we should have the conceptual design report and the cost estimates uh, in 2018, something like this. Okay, this is uh, the poster and the photograph from the kickoff meeting. There were more than 340 participants, a successful event in Geneva. And personally, we are signing MOUs here. I took a few photographs so for some of our colleagues. And at the moment, we have 43 collaboration members plus CERN as a host institute and covering large parts of Europe and Eastern Europe and some Asian countries. And a couple of US universities, the US DOE laboratories, they are not allowed or permitted at the moment to, to join this, but we can have um, the US universities as partners. Um, study. We have also a lot of coordinators. FCC study coordination group looks like this. So Michael, Benedict, and myself are doing the overall study coordination, and then we have coordinators for all the various aspects. Hadron Collider Physics Experiments is Fabiola Cianotti, Austin Ball, and Michelangelo Mangano, and for the Lepton Collider, Alain, John Ellis, Christoph Grosjean, and Patrick Janot. And for the Lepton Hadron Collider, Max Klein, Oliver Bruining, etc. And then the Hadron Collider Exciter design is done by Daniel Schulte, Miguel Jimenez, and uh, Mike Seifers from MSU. <coughs> Lepton Collider, Jörg Wenninger, Miguel Jimenez, Olivinas. It was interesting. We, we, got, we, we are trying to internationalize this coordination group. So already 
already Christoph and John are not from CERN, and Alain is not from CERN, and then uh, we have Mike Seifers and Uli both from the US, and they were both already part of the SSC study, so Mike Seifers, for example, was in charge of the collider, and Uli was in charge of uh, one of the boosters. So we, we're trying to include the expertise of a previous similar study and also connect the US community. This is a picture from the collaboration board meeting. There were about 80 participants, one per institute, and Lenny was elected as the interim collaboration board chair. He's also chair of the CLIC collaboration, so there is an interesting trade-off between the linear collider and the circular collider. Okay, then we had this design study proposal submitted in September, and the good news was last week we heard from Brussels that it was approved uh, with a maximum rating, 15 out of 15 points, which is... Uh, Excellent, so now we have, I think, two and a half weeks to, to finalize this consortium agreements. You can see the members are Italy, from Italy, France, Germany, UK, Spain, Finland, Switzerland, and Japan. This study concentrates on the key aspects of the Hadron Collider. Okay, resource status at CERN in the medium term plan. There are 30 FTEs allocated to the study, and also 30 fellows and doctoral students. So together, about 3,600 per month. And uh, in the collaboration, in this design study, there are about maybe 1,100 per month foreseen in this design study, which is supported by the European Union, plus another few hundred uh, from other agreements. So, but we are missing maybe another, another 2,500 to complete the study. Okay, then this is a poster of the FCC week in Washington. The registration deadline has been extended, so you can still register if you're interested. And this is a draft program, and we're hoping to see you there, of course. In conclusion, conclusions, fast-growing activities in circular energy frontiers, circular colliders worldwide, and uh, with this mandate from the European Strategy Update, this FCC collaboration is formed, and there are many innovation opportunities in magnets, SIF, and other technical areas. Uh, okay, that's it, I think. So anyway, the future starts now with the FCCE. Thank you very much. Because he just flew from America last night, so he's a little bit jet-lagged. Is there any questions for Frank? Yes. There is any plan or hope to insert the 16 uh, Tesla magnet as soon as they will be available inside the LHC tunnel. Uh, 28, uh, uh, let's say 28 uh, TV are not uh, a negligible uh, energy. <clears throat> yes, so. At the moment, this is not the plan. Uh, we, had, we had an earlier study, which was called the High Energy LHE, which was to install 20 Tesla magnets in the LHE to increase the LHE energy. But that was not, we had a workshop on that, but there was no, no completely compelling physics case presented. But installing higher field magnets in the LHE is always a back, back, uh, back off option. In case we, we have problems getting a 100 kilometer tunnel, we can always try to install a higher field magnets in the LHC, but, but even that will not, be, will not be very cheap. And it will stop the operation of the LHC. If you build a new tunnel, we can, we can build that new machine without interfering with the LHC operation. Yeah. Frank, can you say in 10 uh, words how easy or difficult it is to dig uh, the 100 kilometer tunnel? The question is how difficult it is to dig the 100 kilometer tunnel? Yeah, yeah, it should not be difficult. Uh, I will show in the next talk we have now a tunnel optimization tool which allows to find the best configuration in the orientation and depth and uh, angle. You can play with this tool and find the optimum, but, uh, and you can, you can choose to be almost always in the, in the preferred Molas region. Um, so I think that. 
it seems uh, I think the tunnel technology has improved even uh, significantly compared to the time when lab was built. So we don't expect any problem and any any water inflow. Things should be easy, no? In China, they are building 500 kilometer tunnel every year. Also, we only want 100 kilometer over over 10 years. Yeah, yeah. In China. Last week, yeah, last week we had a talk on the uh, on the Chinese machine, and they explained that uh, uh, by the time this machine would come, they, they made a special um, section of the Chinese army to dig tunnels. And uh, that section is, uh, presently is starting to lack a uh, project. So uh, they hope to, uh, to work on, to use that as a possibility. Uh, maybe we should invite them to Europe. Um, OK, I think, uh, I think we, uh, this microphone doesn't seem to work. So. It interferes with the wireless. So you stop you should stop sending emails so that I can talk. <laughs>